So you buy a personal computer, you open it up to find out what's inside of it, and you find out there's nothing inside of it, just a bunch of empty slots. What kind of boards can you buy to add functionality to your computer? We'll help you answer that question today as we take a look at add-on boards on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by CompuServe, featuring an online reference library, Wall Street reports, at-home shopping, airline reservations, games, and hundreds of other services. CompuServe, helping people get the most from computers. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, we're talking about add-on boards today, and believe it or not, that little guy is an add-on board. It's, of course, so small, the thing is actually called a charge card. It's made by a company in Canada. And what you do with this thing is you put it into your 286 machine, and it lets you access extended memory, even though you're operating in the real mode. When we talk about add-on boards, there are really two strategies out there in the marketplace in the IBM world where you have open machines, and you can put in these boards. Then there's the Macintosh world with a closed box, and you really can't change it at all. Has either one of these strategies turned out to be better in the long run? Well, Stuart, they both work. In Apple's case, the Macintosh, it's a tightly controlled environment. The app application writer can always assume, for example, there's high-res graphics there, mm -hmm. there's a mouse there, and that's good. In the IBM PC case, uh, software has to account for, say, four different kinds of uh, display devices, uh, four or five different mouse types, or maybe no right. mouse at all. And so it makes it more difficult to write the application in that case. But for the consumer, the advantage is you can build your own computer system out of boards like this, and it can be very customized to exactly what you need. Gary, that's what we'll do today. We'll take a look at the most important kinds of add-on boards. We'll see the new generation of multifunction memory boards. We'll take a look at a VGA graphics card. We'll see the new Intel inboard 386. And we'll see a board that turns your PC into a fax machine. Now, most people who buy add-on boards buy them through a mail order house. So we start today by visiting the biggest of those mail order houses, Jameco Electronics, right near here in Belmont, California. Jameco Electronics in Belmont, California is a mature company, at least in Silicon Valley terms. The company was founded in 1974 in a garage, and it grew up with the computer industry, providing components, boards, and parts for what was then a very different market. Say before 84, people were buying their systems, they were happy with them. But as their needs grew, and this computer, computer craze grew, I think they needed, they saw a need for expandability, say like in RAM cards or multifunction cards, or say adding on a hard disk drive along with a controller card. Add-in boards are among the most popular items in Jameco's catalog, with sales sometimes increasing tenfold in a year, especially in the case of color graphics cards. The apparently insatiable desire for more memory and speed has made board sales an important part of Jameco's income. The introduction of new technology, like the IBM PS2, is not of much concern to the company, at least for now. What that does for us, it actually helps us out, because the PS2, okay, their price may be way up here. Features are fantastic. They have all, you know, all these different gadgets, new drives, new speeds, and so forth. But then our aftermarket for, say, like the XT compatibles and AT compatibles actually increases because the people are interested in using you know, a lower end product paying a lower end price, but still with some decent features like basically all you need for computing. You just don't have the latest. At least part of the reason for the success of the add-in card has to be the drop in price. One of Jameco's first boards was a card that provided 80 columns of text on the Apple II monitor. Its price then, $395. Today, it's all yours for $40.
Joining us in the studio now is Rick Rolfe. He's product marketing manager with AST Research and sitting next to Rick Buzz Roberts, VGA product manager with Paradise Systems. Gary? Rick, AST has been in the add-on board business for quite a number of years. Uh, what, what do people really ask for in terms of add-ons? Well, the obvious ones are ports, additional memory, the things that we've been really well known for. Six Pack Plus is one of the best examples of that type of product. But lately we've been seeing requests for additional things. Communication boards are really coming on big for us as well, so our Datacom group is doing very mm -hmm. well. And we've also expanded beyond simple enhancement boards to building our own PCs, the ASD Premium 286, which is the machine we'll be using today for the demo. Okay, now you're going to be showing some, uh, what, extended memory? Expanded, expanded memory, expanded memory. actually. <laughs> okay. We're going to be talking about expanded memory. I would explain, memory. I mean, people yeah. are confused. What's the difference in extended memory and expanded memory? Okay, extended memory is a type of memory that's available in 286 or 386 machines, which have a larger address space than do the original PCs, the 8088 processor machines. It's memory that's addressable only in protected mode on the 286, and it can be addressed in uh, 386 protected mode as well on a 386 mm -hmm. machine. Expanded memory, on the other hand, is an additional type of add-in memory which is swapped into the conventional memory space of the computer, whether it's an 8088 or a 286. That's to overcome that 640K limitation. Exactly right. right. Mm -hmm. right. It, fools the computer into being able to deal with more memory than it otherwise would be able to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell us about this board now. Sure. What we're going to be showing with the Premium 286 is an expanded memory computer, but we wanted to emphasize that it's not simply a function of the computer itself we're using. We also have boards that span the entire range of processors and bus types. For mm -hmm. example, for a, an 8088 machine, a PC, XD, or even the Model 30, the uh, 8086, there's mm -hmm. the Rampage 2, which is a 2 megabyte EMS, EMS 4.0 memory board. For 286-based machines and compatibles, we have the Rampage 286, and for the Model 50 and 60, for the PS2 line, we have the Rampage 2 286. All three of them provide two megabytes. Can you give us yeah, a let's, kind let's of before and after sure. demonstration of using the board? What we'd like to show here is what this can do for the average user. People have become dependent upon things like RAM disks, print spoolers, mm -hmm. RAM mm -hmm. resident utilities, and these things can use a lot of memory. Right here we have uh, a RAM disk, since we don't have any expanded memory yet, it's in conventional memory. And now I'm going to load up Sidekick Plus, which is one of the more popular mm -hmm. add-in type of products. And when you bring in the system memory size from Sidekick, you'll notice that it's showing 258K of hard disk space being used as virtual memory because there is no expanded memory available. So that takes a while for it to come in. Now we're going to load up one, two, three, and we're going to work on our budget. Now, we have a RAM disk in there for overlays for files. We have our RAM resident utility sidekick plus, and what we have now is an error. There's just not enough not memory enough left memory. in the machine. And indeed, when you do worksheet status, you see that there's a total of 14 bytes left, mm -hmm. and there's no expanded mm -hmm. memory available. So what I'm going to do now is to reboot the machine enable the expanded memory and then show how you can by using expanded memory use all the same utilities that you were just using and still preserve your mm -hmm. conventional memory for use by applications and programs first thing that happens is the expanded memory manager will come up initialize the memory and now all that ram disk is going out into expanded memory sidekick plus when you bring it up will show that it's got 68K of conventional memory being used, but it's no longer using mm -hmm. the hard disk as virtual memory. It's using 800K of expanded memory. So now when you bring up your application program, Lotus 1, 2, 3, and you load your budget, it will come up. It won't show the error message. Mm -hmm. And uh, it takes a few seconds longer. But when you show worksheet status, it does show you 315K of conventional as well as 276K of expanded memory still available. And of course, your sidekick is still available for you. Right. So you can do a sort of multitasking with this, and this is a very rudimentary way of doing it. It also enables you to, oops, excuse me. It also enables you to uh, use the program on top of another. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. So. Okay. Good. Would you slide the keyboard sure. over now to, uh, to Buzz? What about compatibility problems here with software on these boards? Right? There's really not that big of an issue with compatibility. It, it's designed to run under most DOS systems, and there's very few programs that cause any problems of any sort with expanded memory. The one uh, thing that's come up that's trying to alleviate some of the confusion in the industry about uh, expanded memory types is now the unified specification, mm -hmm. the 4.0. At first there was EMS 3.2, which was designed to provide you a way to move data, but didn't give you a way to move program code, so you couldn't execute more than one program at a time. Double EMS then came out, and it was an enhancement to the original EMS specification. 
After a couple of years, the EMS 4.0 was agreed on, and it essentially calls for an underlying hardware platform identical to WMS with a different mm -hmm. tweak to it here and okay. there, nothing mm -hmm. that major. The important thing being that now that 4.0 compatibility is coming out, people are providing 4.0 drivers with underlying 3.2 hardware. And it really doesn't provide you the sorts of things that 4.0 hardware yeah. can do. So to be in the best interest of uh, someone who's contemplating going out and buying an expanded memory board to know exactly what mm -hmm. kind of hardware mm -hmm. they're getting underlying that. Buzz, we want to turn to graphics cards now, and that's Paradise's business. What do you have there? Uh, I've brought with me the Paradise VGA Plus card today. And the, this is the card that is uh, based on the IBM new video standard that came along with the introduction of the PS2 family mm -hmm. of computers last year. Give us an example of uh, what VGA looks like. Well, VGA gives you uh, higher resolution and more colors on screen than the previous display standard. And uh, I'm bringing up now under Windows, uh, a few windows on the screen showing our 800 by 600 graphics. Now this is above and beyond IBM's standard 640 by 480 graphics, mm -hmm. and this provides you over 60% more on screen um, information. So that's an example of a Windows type application. Now we're going into a CAD type application. Mm -hmm. Again, this is uh, 800 by 600 graphics, and uh, this is running AutoCAD. Mm -hmm. And what are we going to see? And we'll see the uh, world famous <laughs> uh, Spaceship Columbia here. Uh -huh. And this again, with 800 by 600 resolution, you're able to get that much more information on the screen. And uh, as always, that helps in your editing capabilities. Mm -hmm. Now we'll turn to text application. This is our 132 column WordStar Professional running right now. And with the VGA character font, it's a much more readable type mm -hmm. of application here. Yeah. And again, when you can see 132 columns at one time, it's that much easier to edit and you can create a better document. Now under GEM, we will be running Ventura Publisher, a desktop application. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, this ties text and graphics all together. And uh, you can see that there's quite a bit of information on the screen. Again, this is our 800 by 600. And uh, we provide this with a driver with our card. OK. Can you just show us some uh, pretty pictures that would take advantage of the VGA? Sure. That's uh, one of the big things with VGA is the number of colors on screen at one time. And I'm going to show a few slides here in our 320 by 200 uh, graphics resolution with 256 colors on screen out of a possible mm -hmm. 256,000. Okay, that's great. Well, that's Buzz, nice. Rick, thank you very much. Now, when you think of add-on boards, you tend to think of the PC-compatible world, but of course, with the Macintosh 2, you've got slots, and people are coming out with add-on boards for the Mac. Wendy Woods has a report. According to new air safety rules mandated by the FAA and Congress, almost all commercial aircraft will need some form of onboard collision avoidance system within five years. But collision avoidance systems are expensive, up to $200,000 per plane, and there's a need for a cheaper alternative. Well, believe it or not, an add-in board for the Macintosh 2 is helping design it. It's called TV Producer, and it's being used by Radar Data Systems in Burlingame, California, to design a visual system that displays current air traffic around a plane with an aeronautical chart or map of the ground. TV Producer, from Computer Friends of Portland, Oregon, allows the two displays to be superimposed. In this case, one of them, the map, is coming from a video cassette. The actual technology that will go into making RDS's low-cost collision avoidance system is proprietary and will not involve use of TV Producer. But the card is making it possible to create a demonstration of the ultimate product and to help the programmers choose colors and on-screen design before committing them to silicon. We can get a good feel for, uh, for a lot of these things early on in the project uh, rather than finding out later when we've done <laughs> extensive programming uh, efforts uh, to, to accomplish the same thing and find that there's a, a problem comes up. Schulenberger expects his first air traffic alert system to be on the market within two years. In Burlingame, California, for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. Joining us in the studio now is Rich Bader. Rich is general manager of Intel's PC Enhancement Operation, and they're based in Hillsboro, Oregon. 
You know, Stuart, uh, Intel's had a lot of success with the 386 processor, mm -hmm. clearly. And uh, one of the nice things about this board, I understand, is it's a, a thousand dollar or less uh, add-on to your PC XT or whatever it is to make it into a 386, yeah. plus a megabyte of memory. And so that's a pretty cost-effective uh, way to go, it sounds like. So instead of buying a 386, you can buy the board and your machine runs like a 386. Absolutely right. And what allows you to do that is a host of technology. Uh, 16 megahertz, 3 to 6 microprocessor, socket for the 387 math coprocessor for doing math intensive applications. As we said, a megabyte of 32 bit DRAM, an optional capability for an additional 2 meg. So mm -hmm. you can put up to 3 meg really in your, in your old PC or XT. And in addition to all of the uh, logic that comes on the board, we also provide uh, a, a bunch of software utilities that come with it that do EGA caching, disk caching, uh, provide expanded memory capability, Lotus Intel Microsoft mm -hmm. expanded memory. So it's really a complete upgrade, not only CPU performance, but disk, uh, display, and memory. Are there any incompatibilities that you know of that, as far as uh, the hardware is concerned? Things we, that people should watch out for? We did a tremendous amount of compatibility testing, and all the known DOS software that we've been able to get our hands on runs just okay. great on the Can board. Can you show us how this works? Give sure. Us a, give some time comparisons and so on. Well, uh, some off-quoted uh, numbers, Norton's SI is an example, 15.3 for what that's mm -hmm. worth. Uh, well, I think you have some demos here, don't you? Show yeah, let's show us from a typical right. user's point of view how things would run faster using that board. Sure. Uh, if you just do a dir, take a directory of the machine, this is what the machine looks like running at XT speeds. Okay. And from the keyboard, I can control the speed, and you can see that the mm -hmm. dir is dramatically faster. Okay. Now, you wouldn't spend 995 just to make <laughs> your dir go, right. but certainly if we take a look at, uh, at a different application, such as AutoCAD, engineers are very excited about the performance of the 3D6 and the 387. And again, here's what the performance of it looks like in slow mode. Now, this is what an XT would do, but the 3D7 math coprocessor is making things go a little faster mm -hmm. than you might be used to. Mm -hmm. It takes about 10 seconds to redraw the Spaceship Columbia like that. If, however, we now switch into the high speed mode and do it again, you can see that there's a mm -hmm. dramatic performance improvement. Right. Makes it usable, very usable for CAD. You bet. Mm -hmm. Not just for engineers, we also have, as an example, Lotus 123. Here we have a spreadsheet that has about 2,000 random numbers that we generate. And in slow mode, it takes about 10 seconds for the spreadsheet to recalc. You can see the weight flag going mm -hmm. on up there in the corner. After we generate all the numbers, we add them all across all the rows and across all the columns. There you go. And at high speed, you can see it's significantly mm -hmm. faster, about mm -hmm. two seconds for that case. Uh, the other example I have is many people think that for power uses of um, CAD packages and spreadsheets you'd use it, but another interesting uh, case is simply for word processing. And here we have uh, Microsoft Word version 4 with a typical document up, and we uh, will just scroll through the document. Here I'm hitting page down, and you can see that the screens come up rather quickly, but nonetheless when we go to high speed mode, mm. it's as quick as I can hit the key. So we believe that the 3 to 6 really has some performance improvement for just about all PC users. Mm -hmm. Now, what's Intel coming up with as far as new add-on boards? Oh, <laughs> you can certainly expect us to see us continue to come out with uh, new product lines. In fact, there'll be some uh, products in the communications, PC communications mm -hmm. area that we'll be uh, introducing in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. Rich, thank you very much. In just a minute, we'll take a look at an add-on board that turns your PC into a fax machine. So stay tuned. Joining us in the studio now is Jan Ozer. Jan is general manager of the fax division at Quadrum, and they're based in Norcross, Georgia. Stuart, you know, facsimile transmissions are becoming more and more a part of our lives. Sure. You know, every day, put a sheet of paper in the machine and send it over a telephone line. It's one line of those things, it. how did I get along without one? Exactly, yeah. Now, this is kind of an interesting board because it makes your personal computer into something different from the computer. It's a, it's really makes it into a fax machine, I guess, a whole lot more. How does it, Jan, how does this make, the, how is this different from a fax machine when you put this in your PC? Well, it saves you a lot of time, Gary. Uh, most of the documents that are being sent today over traditional faxes are, are created in the computer. Rather than printing it out and walking it down to the fax machine, you can send it directly from your PC. Saves a lot of time, and you get a, a clearer result at the other end. Let's get going here and send a fax now. We have another setup over there. There's a real fax machine on the other part of the set there, and I want you to send uh, something over to that machine. Let's see how this all works. I'm naming the file to be sent. Um, and then searching for the phone, all we have is the, uh, the San Mateo College number in here. 
uh, but you can load as many numbers as you can fit in the directory. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a storage bound, not program bound. Press enter, and then we want to transmit it immediately. Okay. So there's only two or three commands that you need to go through uh, in order to send a fax from the PC. So this, this program is a terminate state res resident program then as it pops up when you... That's correct, uh, like Sidekick okay. or some other programs. Right. Okay, so again, you were in the middle of a, a WordPerfect document here. That's you correct. You said send a fax, so you just called up uh, the fax function here, mm -hmm. and it just called the other fax machine, which is over there on the other side of our studio, and it's sending it the fax. One of the, one of the things that we wanted, uh, we felt it was necessary to accomplish with this program was to make it easy to use. Therefore, it's compatible with most word processing programs, and in fact, can can uh, change word processing programs into fax files automatically. Uh, it, uh, what you saw me do is all you need to, to do in order to send a fax from any mm -hmm. uh, word processing file. Now, the basic technology we're dealing with uh, group three, is it? That's group correct. Three, and and uh, also the, the data rate is what? Uh, data rate on this particular product is 4,800 baht. Uh, okay. the, pr the price of this is 395, which is the lowest price fax board on the market mm -hmm. by uh, against 9600 baud yeah. models by about $600. And then what is the average transmission time then for, uh, for a 4800 baud piece of paper? Um, for, a <laughs> for a page of uh, text, it takes about a minute. Uh -huh. Okay, Jen, just so we notice, there's the fax coming out of a fax machine at the other end of a telephone over there. And uh, we're sort of simulating a business transaction here, right, Jen? Tell me what we're, we're doing. What we're doing is confirming an oral purchase order. We've, um, I've sent the gentleman who uh, verbally ordered something to me well, now we're getting it sent, and uh, it will be sent back to me. Okay, so again, Sarah over there is signing that purchase order, and she's going to fax that back to our machine over here. That's correct. It will be, even though we're in the middle of WordPerfect, as you can see, it will be stored automatically and saved to disk. Uh, while you can't use WordPerfect, while you're in the pro uh, while a fax is being received, you can uh, check the file and uh, view the file from WordPerfect. Uh -huh. so oh, do you have options as far as printing the documents out then? Yes, you can, you can print to most laser printers and most dot matrix printers. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that has dot addressable graphics can be used. Okay, and what about the scanning process? Uh, obviously this doesn't include the scanner <laughs> at that price. Well, the, we're compatible with uh, many scanners. We're compatible with Hewlett Packard, Chinon, and Princeton Graphics as well as a few others. Uh, you don't really need a scanner for most, most transmissions. Basically what you need uh, is what you're inputting into the computer through your word processor. Mm -hmm. and okay, so, so you were in the middle of WordPerfect again. Mm -hmm. It automatically interrupted and told you that it's receiving a facsimile now. That's right. And then, okay, I guess it'll take about how long again for that page to Less be than a minute to be received from the, uh, from the facsimile. Now, can you be doing any work while, you're, uh, while the transmission's going on? No, right now the machine is locked up and dedicated to the fax. We've got a, a, a 9600 baud board with a, with a microprocessor that would allow background operation. That will be out uh, very shortly. Okay, okay. The, and so it's complete? It's now complete, and the program is restored. As you can see, there's no loss of data. You're back in okay, work. So suppose we want to take a look at the document we just got. Okay. We go to the transaction log, and we just received RECV0032. Uh -huh. it's, uh, so we gave it a file name. That's correct. And now we hit F3. And there it is. And I'm lucky today, <laughs> <laughs> as demonstrations go. Okay. And as we see it, it comes in really as a graphic, not as a... As, as a as a text. As a as text file. That's correct. And here's, here's my signature, which um, we can go into in a few seconds and show that uh -huh. was attached, and also the signature of the recipient. That's uh, great. Okay, we're out of time. Jan, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. We're for our look at add-on boards. Hope we'll see you here next week on the Computer Chronicles. Random access file this week. Now that Apple has hiked prices on the Macintosh, it's followed up with the introduction of two new Apple II products. The company announced a new Apple II C Plus featuring a CPU four times faster than the original, a three and a half inch internal drive with five times the capacity of the old one, an internal power supply, and space for an internal modem. Apple also released a new operating system for the Apple II GS called GSOS. It's a 16-bit system that lets the 2GS run a lot faster. It will also enable the 2GS to handle large files, including those using the High Sierra system for CD-ROMs. Apple also formally unveiled the new Mac 2X with the ability to access MS-DOS and OS2 files, as well as Apple ProDOS files. And there are rumors that this is just the beginning, with announcements expected of a new low-end Macintosh, a new laptop Mac, and a new SE using the 68030 chip. 
The bus war continued to heat up last week with major hardware companies announcing their support for the new EISA standard. Jumping on the bandwagon were Acer, AT&T, DEC, K-Pro, Unisys, and Wang. Meanwhile, IBM played it cool, hinting at some new boards that will finally take advantage of the MCA bus. And Big Blue also announced, as predicted, a new PS2 Model 30 using the 8286 chip and the old AT-style bus. And who is IBM in bed with these days? Well, none other than its old nemesis, Steve Jobs. IBM has reportedly struck a deal with Jobs for the right to use the new user interface from the next computer, due to be announced in about a week. The rumors are growing about what that next computer will have in it. The latest leak says look for an integrated fax modem, an erasable CD drive, and TV quality video. Several new product announcements came out of the recent Seabold conference on desktop publishing. Adobe announced a PC version of Illustrator. Aldous showed a major upgrade of freehand. Cricket released Cricket Presents 2.0. Letraset showed off a new version of Ready, Set, Go. And Quark announced Quark Style, a set of templates for users who don't want to have to worry about creating fonts, logos, etc. Ultra Network Technologies has announced a new network product called Ultra, which it says is 100 times faster than Ethernet. Execs say the Ultranet can move 1 billion bits per second. Finally, Computer World has announced the results of its computer productivity study listing the top 100 most efficient users of computer technology. Not surprisingly, there was no direct correlation between how much money you spend and how effective your system is. The big winners were utilities who placed four companies in the top ten, banks were in the middle, and retailers did the worst. General Motors, which spent nearly three billion dollars on information systems last year, came in only 96th, and oil giants Mobil and Exxon didn't even make it to the top 100. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by CompuServe, featuring an online reference library, Wall Street reports, at-home shopping, airline reservations, games, and hundreds of other services. CompuServe, helping people get the most from computers. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $3 to PTV Publications, Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Please indicate program date.